Now, the first thing that we've got to get down is this term dynamic range. Right? We really have to understand this whole concept of dynamic range because basically everything a compressor does is about modifying the dynamic range of audio. Right? So I've got one of those tablets and um, let's draw in a waveform. You did it. There's a waveform of audio going along like this, average level, do 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 like that, and then oop, there's a big peak. Then it goes back to average level, like that, and then oop, there's another big peak. Then it goes back to average level, etc. So let's say like this is a zoomed in section of a waveform for a vocal or something in Cubase or Logic or whatever. Okay, let's change the colour of the pen. So, here and here, these are the loudest peaks in the recording. And then the quietest parts of the recording are like here and here and here and here and here, etc. Now, there's a difference between the loudest peaks and the quietest parts of the recording. And that difference or distance or range is the dynamic range of that recorded performance. Right? And what a compressor does is basically it reduces dynamic range. It reduces the difference between the loudest peaks and the quietest parts of the recording or it reduces the difference between the loudest peaks and the average level of the recording. Okay? And that's what a compressor does. A compressor reduces the dynamic range of audio. Okay? Now, um, there's going to be other areas where you've heard this term dynamic range being used, and we really have to completely understand this, right? So, let's look at this a bit more. Let's say you've got a cassette deck. I know they're a bit out of fashion, but you've got a cassette deck and you read in the specs that your cassette deck has a dynamic range of 60 dB. Now, dB, it just means decibels, right? It's just a measurement of loudness or volume. So our cassette deck has a dynamic range of 60 dB. And that just means that from silence which with tape is just the sound of tape noise or tape hiss. From silence to the loudest thing you can record on that cassette before the onset of tape distortion or tape saturation, our cassette deck has a total available dynamic range of 60 dB. From silence to the loudest thing you can record before the onset of distortion, our cassette deck can contain a total possible dynamic range of 60 dB. And like, let's say you've got a professional reel-to-reel -reel tape machine and it, you might read it has a dynamic range of 90 dB. Well again that just means that from silence, just the sound of tape hiss or noise, to the loudest thing you can record before the onset of tape distortion or tape saturation, our reel-to-reel -reel has a total available dynamic range of 90 dB. It can contain a total possible dynamic range of 90 dB. Now digital is similar but slightly different. Uh, a consumer compact disc has a dynamic range of 96 dB. Now uh, with digital there's no tape noise or hiss so the lowest level you can have is silence. All right, so from silence to the loudest thing you can possibly record our compact disc has a total available dynamic range of 96 dB. From silence to the loudest thing you can record, it can contain a total possible dynamic range of 96 dB. And you know, you might have a Cubase Logic or Pro Tools set up with a particular audio interface running at a certain sample and bit rate, and you'll read that that recording system has a dynamic range of, let's say, 130 dB. And again, that just means that from silence to the loudest thing you can record, that recording system can contain a total possible dynamic range of 130 dB.
Right? Okay, now there, there's a difference with the upper limit between digital and tape. With digital, we have an upper limit that we cannot go above. And that upper limit is expressed as 0 dB, right? And in digital, we cannot go above that upper limit. If we go over that upper limit in digital, even a tiny little bit, we get horrible digital distortion, which sounds like <coughs> horrible crackling like that, right? But tape is different. With tape, we have an upper limit above which we get tape distortion or tape saturation. But with tape, you can drive the signal onto the tape louder than that upper limit, and then you get tape distortion or tape saturation, right? But a little bit of that actually sounds quite good. And recording engineers for decades have deliberately driven the signal too loud onto some of the tracks of the tape to deliberately get tape distortion or tape saturation because it, it can sound quite good on some things, like it can make drums sound more powerful, or it can give an edge to a vocal. Right? And you'll know that you know you can get tape plugins that imitate the sound of tape, and you plug them into the channels of your DAW, and they imitate a tape sound. Um, and if you drive them hard, you you get the sound of tape distortion or tape saturation. Right? Okay. But with digital, we have this upper limit expressed as 0 dB, we cannot go over that limit. Right? Okay, now, look, you mustn't get confused. When we talk about the dynamic range of a recorded performance, we're talking about the difference between the loudest peaks and the quietest parts of that recording. Or we're talking about the difference between the loudest peaks and the average level of that recorded performance. But when we talk about the dynamic range of a recording system, we're talking about the total available dynamic range that that recording system has. Right? Now in the case of this vocal waveform I drew in here, the peaks, let's, they might be 10 or 12 dB louder than the average level. Let's say our vocal performance here has a dynamic range of 12 or 15 dB but it can be recorded on a system with a total available dynamic range of 130 dB or 90 dB or whatever. Okay, Just because a recording system has all that dynamic range available, that doesn't mean that we use all that dynamic range when we record. Okay, now there's another area where you might have heard this term dynamic range being used, and that is when people talk about the mastering of tracks. Now, when a mastering engineer masters a track, there's several things they might do. Um, they might use EQ to correct EQ problems. Uh, they might use EQ to give the whole track a slightly different EQ balance. And, and another thing they do is they make sure that the track has a good strong volume level. All right. Now, remember, I told you that in digital, we have this upper limit of 0 dB that we can't go above when we're working in digital, right? So let's draw that in. Boom, there we are. So there's our 0 dB upper limit, and let's say this waveform now is a track that I'm mastering, and I want it to have a good strong volume level. So I get my track, and I start bringing up its level to make it nice and loud. I'll bring it louder, louder, and louder, but that is as far as I can raise the level, because I can't go over that 0 dB upper limit. So these peaks can't go over that 0 dB line. But my average level is down here, maybe 10 or 12 dB lower than those peaks. So my average level is going to be 10 or 12 dB below the maximum loudest it can be. It won't sound that loud. So generally speaking, in mastering, compression is used to reduce the dynamic range. And once you've reduced the dynamic range, so the peaks are not so loud compared to the average level, you can then bring your average level up much closer to the maximum and your track is much louder, like that. Okay, now the thing is, a long time ago the record labels all started using more and more compression at the mastering stage to reduce the dynamic range of their masters down more and more and more and more and more. So they could then ram the average level up 
louder and louder and louder and louder okay and somebody coined the phrase loudness wars and what they meant was that it was almost as if the labels were having a war between them to see who could make their tracks the loudest but the problem is if you use too much compression and you reduce the dynamic range of your music right down yes you can then raise the average level up to be really really loud really close to the zero db maximum but when you reduce all the dynamic range down the music sounds terrible because it no longer has any dynamic range there's no longer any difference between the loud and quiet bits it loses all its its life and this whole business of all the labels using too much compression at the mastering stage became known as loudness wars like the labels were having a war to see who could make their tracks the loudest um, let's go and have a look at this image here okay so here we have an image from the Wikipedia page on the subject of loudness wars and it's an image of the stereo waveform of the song black or white by Michael Jackson so here at the top we have the original mastering of the track from the 1991 Dangerous album. And then here we have the remastering of the track for the 1995 History album. And then here at the bottom we have the final mastering of the track for the 2007 Ultimate Collection album. Right. So let's look at the difference between them. Now, if we look at the original version, okay, this is the stereo waveform of the song. So one of these waveforms is the left side and one is the right side in stereo. If we just look at the edge of the waveform on one side, this up and down bristle effect on the edge of the waveform, that's the dynamic range of the music going up and down in level. Okay, This version has been compressed at the mastering stage, but not too much. So it's got a good amount of dynamic range. There's a good amount of up and down movement on the edge of the waveform. Okay, now this scale here, this isn't a dB scale for the vertical axis in this plot, but generally speaking, with this version, the peaks come up to this white line, which you can think of as like a safety line. It's maybe 6 dB below the absolute maximum zero that you can't go above. The absolute zero maximum is the top of the black box, where it joins the grey border. So the peaks extend up to this white safety line, and the average level is down here across there where I'm moving the mouse right so there's a fair amount of dynamic range it hasn't been overly compressed it's got a good amount of dynamic range but it won't sound that loud okay and then we look at the remastering of the track for the 1995 history album and straight away we can see there's less bristle effect on the edge of the waveform there's less dynamic range this version has been compressed more at the mastering stage and there's less dynamic range the peaks now all extend up above the white safety line. The peaks come up to just a few dB below absolute zero, the maximum, and the average level has been brought up closer to the white line across here somewhere. So this version has got less dynamic range. It's been compressed more, but it's, it's, it will sound louder than the previous version. Okay, and then we look at the final mastering of the track for the 2007 Ultimate Collection CD, and I mean, for God's sake, look at it. It's been so heavily compressed at the mastering stage, there is almost no dynamic range left. There's almost no up and down bristle effect on the edge of the waveform. Okay, these black lines you see dropping down now and again, that's not the dynamic range of the music going up and down. That is where there is a little gap in the music. If you look at this section here, where there's continuous playing without a break, or this end section where there's continuous playing without a break, there's virtually no up and down movement on the edge of the waveform at all. The peaks now all extend up to be touching absolute zero, the top of the black box. And the average level is just a few dB below that, up above the white line. So this version has only got a few dB of dynamic range left in just the last few dB before absolute zero. It's been so heavily compressed it has almost no dynamic range left at all. Now this version will sound ear bleedingly loud, but people say this version sounds terrible because it has no dynamic range. It's had all the dynamic range smashed out of it with massive amounts of compression. Okay, now, just to say, this is a pop song, and pop and balls-to-the-wall rock music generally doesn't have a lot of dynamic range in, in the genres. 
Some music like jazz, classical and film score has a lot of dynamic range a lot of the time. We've all heard a typical jazz recording, you know, where the band plays a quiet bit like and then they'll play a really loud bit and then quiet again. And in classical and film score you'll often get the thing you know where maybe the string section is playing a quiet motif and in between that you'll get loud accented bits from the brass section or whatever you know like quiet and then loud and then back to quiet again so some music can have a lot of dynamic range in it a lot of the time pop and rock generally doesn't but even for a pop song this original mastering has got a good amount of dynamic range. It hasn't been overly compressed at the mastering stage. It won't be that loud, but people say this version will sound much better than the final mastering of the song, which has been compressed so heavily that it's got no dynamic range left. This version will sound way louder, but it'll sound terrible. Okay. Whereas the original mastering, with plenty of dynamic range, isn't so loud, but it sounds good because it's got plenty of dynamic range. And that's like the whole loudness wars thing, and you need to be familiar with this to be able to have a conversation about this topic, okay? Okay, so you should have this now, dynamic range. So to finish up this section, um, let's quickly look now at how having too much dynamic range causes a problem in real life when we're working in our studio and then we'll move on. Now how does having too much dynamic range cause a problem in real life and how does the compressor help us to fix that problem? Okay well here on the left is Logic 9 um, and there's a backing track here that I made some time ago it was just messing around with an Indian sample pack to make some backing loop music and here you can see I sung a vocal this green and yellow waveform all right now I sang the vocal very quiet here right and then very loud here and then very quiet again and then very loud right so this performance has a lot of dynamic range okay there's a lot there's a big difference between the loudest bits and the quietest bits so this performance has a lot of dynamic range okay now there is a compressor on this track but it's been bypassed. Okay, so how would this work in the real world? Well, over here on the mixer, in mono for the camera, on this channel here, I've got the backing music. And on this channel, I've got the vocal. Now I need the fader to be up really high like this so that it's high enough for the quiet singing at the beginning. But the problem then is that when the loud singing comes in, the fader is gonna be right up high and it'll be too high for the louder singing and the loud singing will blast the mix out because the fader's too high. Okay, so here we go, let's hear that. This is the quiet bit, I'm only whispering. It's a very quiet bit, I'm whispering. It's just a quiet bit, only just whispering. Very quiet. Here's the loud bit. Now hear it! Whoa! <laughs> you see, as soon as the loud bit comes in, it blasts the mix to pieces because the fader was set too high up here for the quieter bit of singing. And that's the problem when you've got too much dynamic range. There's such a big difference between the loud bits and the quiet bits. Well, what do you do? Well, a compressor solves this problem by reducing the dynamic range. It reduces the difference between the loud bits and the quiet bits, so you no longer have this problem. So what would you do in the old days before compressors, or if you're working on a mix now and you don't have a compressor? Well, you have to manually adjust the fader to suit the material. You have to have the fader up high for when the quiet bits are there, and then lower the fader down for when the loud bit comes, and then bring the fader back up when the quiet bit happens again. And this act of raising and lowering the fader to suit the material on the track is called riding the fader. Okay, so now I'm going to ride the fader to suit the vocal in this material. This is the quiet bit. I'm only whispering, it's a very quiet bit. I'm whispering, it's just a quiet bit. Only just whispering, very quiet. Okay, here's the loud bit. Now here is a loud, a loud bit. I'm singing very loud. It's a loud bit, the loud, the loud. 
and now quiet. And now very quiet again, just whispering, only whispering, very quiet. Now the loud bit. And now the loud, the loud, the loud bit. And that's called riding the fader. And that's what you've got to do if you're working on a mix today and you don't have a compressor. But the compressor helps fix this problem, right? So let's now bring the compressor in on the vocal track. And the compressor is going to reduce the dynamic range. And I'm using a lot of compression. So there's going to be very little difference between the quiet and the loud bits. And therefore, we can set our fader to the correct level for the quiet bits. And then when the loud bits come in, they won't be that much louder at all. In fact, there's going to be very little difference because I'm using a lot of compression. This is the quiet bit. I'm only whispering. It's a very quiet bit. I'm whispering. It's just a quiet bit. I'm only just whispering. Very quiet. Here's the loud bit. Now here is a loud, a loud bit. I'm singing very loud. It's a loud bit. The loud, the loud. And back to the quiet. And now very quiet again. Just whispering. Yeah. So that's what a compressor does. It reduces dynamic range. So we don't have this problem of sometimes things being too loud and then sometimes it's too quiet and there's always this big difference between them. So that's basically what a compressor does. All right reduces the dynamic range, reduces the difference between the loud and the quiet bits. Now, I wouldn't recommend you use that much compression in real life on a vocal. I used a huge amount of compression. Uh, and if you use too much compression on something like a vocal, it makes it sound completely unnatural. The loud bits sound completely crushed and squashed. Okay. But you see, I sang the vocal deliberately with massive amounts of dynamic range. I deliberately sang the quiet bits really quiet and the loud bits really, really loud, making a, a vocal performance with a huge amount of dynamic range. Then I used a huge amount of compression to reduce that dynamic range down. But in real life, a vocalist will have better breath control and better mic technique, and they'll move closer to the mic for the quiet bits. They'll move away from the mic for the loud bits, plus they'll have good breath control. So you won't get a vocal with that much difference between loud and quiet. But even then, you'll still use some compression to reduce the dynamic range of the vocal so that the quiet and the loud bits are sitting in the mix at the same level and the vocal balances really nicely in the mix. Okay, Okay. Um, so there you are. That's, that's basically what a compressor does. It reduces dynamic range, reduces the difference between the loud and the quiet bits. And everything the compressor does, all the tricks and everything, they're just variations on that theme, right? Okay, so that's dynamic range and what the compressor does it reduces dynamic range and now let's move on and look at how the compressor works inside and how the basic controls work